very exciting, this being day one. Uh, so welcome to the Bad Game Arcade, officially the, the kind of first event of the week, uh, bringing together panelists here in the space and over Zoom. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join this panel, and there will be room and time for you to jump into the conversation. So if you're joining us via Zoom, we do, um, advise if you're comfortable doing so just to raise a hand and you can turn on your camera and speak freely if you have any questions or comments otherwise of course the chat is activated and if you're in the space and you'd like to jump into the conversation uh, please just let us know by uh, raising your hand and we'll get a microphone to you so that the folks on zoom can hear you okay that's it for me i'm gonna pass it over to scott very quickly to say a few words hi scott Hi, and thanks everyone for being here in the space and for being here online. I appreciate it. And also, thank you to the three panelists here and Will, who is uh, everyone can probably see in the Zoom. So thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to quickly say um, this is the first kind of big event of the week. Um, so I'm just very thankful for everyone taking the time and energy to kind of support this event and to be here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to a whole week kind of talking about the challenges of education and games because I feel so often I hear people being like, educational games suck, or I hear the opposite of, oh, we can just use a game to solve that problem. And I think both those sentences and statements have things that we can pick apart and pull at. And so I'm not gonna sit up here because today's conversation is about a topic that I would love to be more familiar with, and so I can't wait to learn from you all. Um, but I do wanna introduce the chair of the panel, who is someone that I got to meet briefly when I was an MA student here at Concordia, it's Maze Longboat. Um, and Maze Longboat, for anyone who doesn't know, is a Mohawk with family at Six Nations of the Grand River and was raised on the unceded territory of the Squamish Nation near Vancouver, British Columbia. He is the Senior Partner Relations Manager with Unity Technologies and served as Skins Workshop Associate Director with Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, Abtech, and the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, IIS. From, 19, from 2019 to 2021. He holds an MA in Media Studies from Concordia University, which is where we're talking from today. His master's research examined indigenous video game development through the production of his own game, Terra Nova, an award-winning cooperative platformer with an interactive narrative. If you have not checked out Terra Nova, I highly recommend checking it out. It was something I came across in my MA, and I'm really glad I did. Anyways, off to you, Maze, and to everyone here. Thanks for being here. Awesome, yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, thank you for that intro. Um, first. Before we kind of dive into the panel, I'd like to just quickly introduce everybody um, from the, the biographies that they sent us. So uh, to my immediate left here, um, we have Vanessa Racine, who's Anishinaabe from Beaver House First Nation um, and was born in uh, southern Ontario, but has resided in Montreal, just Jage, since 2010. Vanessa is a research assistant and lab coordinator at Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace. She is currently pursuing an MFA in the Individualized Program. Um, and Vanessa's primary research is centered around Anishinaabe video game development and understanding how Anishinaabe understandings of love can be represented through the medium. Additional research search interests include language visibility and revitalization, Anishinaabe Mowin dialect uh, variation in media video games and its role in language learning. Um, two to my left is Gahandawaks Tuisha. Gahandawaks is Bear Clan Mohawk from Ganesatage. Her early years spent attending uh, Ganyangeha Emergent School, growing traditional medicines and practicing ceremonies inform much of her artistic practice today. She earned her BFA specialization in computation arts at Concordia University, where she also worked as a research assistant for Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace and the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. In 2020, she founded Revital Software, a company that specializes in the creation of Indigenous language learning video games. And joining us via Zoom, uh, we also have Will Thompson uh, from the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Will is a professional game designer, writer, and instructional designer. Will has published multiple educational video games and simulations at the University of Oklahoma's K-20 Center. He has also co-authored multiple articles on game-based learning through his work at the K-20 Center. Will's RPG contributions include writing for Paizo Press, Coyote and Crow, and three self-published RPG zines, zines, however you want to pronounce that. <laughs> um, Will is also the designer of Paleo Vet and the Zenobia second place award-winning Winter Rabbit. In his spare time, which is far too infrequent, <laughs> like us all, <laughs> Will researches, uh, researches obscure lore, pines to get lost in the forest, and paints tiny spacemen. Um, welcome, everybody. Super glad to be in conversation with you all today. I'm going to start by throwing 
it over to um, each of you first to just introduce yourself in your own words and then kind of just tell us all a little bit about what your current practice involves. Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Vanessa first. Uh, um, so I'm Vanessa. Uh, so like you mentioned, I'm from Beaver House First Nation, but grew up in Southern Ontario, um, kind of moved here. Uh, trying, and video games wasn't exactly where I thought I'd land, but here I am. Uh, so I did my bachelor's um, in linguistics. So I have a stronger background in uh, linguistic theory and uh, liberal arts, which is more Western focused. Uh, so I guess the way I kind of found myself towards video games was kind of getting fed up with what I was seeing and what I wasn't seeing in media um, and having a couple conversations with people I know, such as um, Noelani Arista, uh, who was a really great mentor for me uh, during my time working at McGill. Uh, and Noelani introduced me to Jason Lewis, uh, where I was kind of given the opportunity to see where I could take uh, the ideas that I had and kind of formulate it into like a game. Um, so now I'm starting, I'm in my second semester, so I just started my master's. Uh, so I'm very, at the very beginnings. Yeah. I think that might be better. Like this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, perfect. So yeah, so I started off um, still kind of in the very like intro production of like what I want to do. So um, kind of this met like towards the end of last semester and starting now I kind of realized that uh, the kind of game I want to make is something that's based on love. And kind of now I'm focusing my research on what does love look like in media? What does love look like in video games? And how can I represent um, love through my nation's perspective? Amazing. Thank you so much. I have questions awesome. for you already, but we'll, we'll, we'll hand it over to Kahanda Walks. What am I doing again? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, what am I saying? <laughs> introducing myself? Yeah, you're introducing yourself and just talking a little bit about what you're doing these days. Okay, cool. So, um, as was said already, I'm Gahantawak Tuisha. I'm Mohawk from Gunasidage, and I'm a co-founder, one of three, of Revital Software, which is an indie, indigenous-owned uh, language revitalization game studio. Which feels like a mouthful. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And Will, what are you up to these days? Uh, Osio, um... Yeah, I, so I've been working at the K-20 Center for about 10 years now. Uh, my time there, we've published a lot of educational video games, um, serious games, um, to be more technical, and uh, for a variety of audiences, but mostly um, high school and undergraduate um, audiences. So we've done games on um, financial literacy, mindset, a lot of different STEM subjects, career awareness, all kinds of things like that. Um, and then also in 2017, I co-founded um, Absurdist Productions, which is a um, sort of a little side project that I've been working on for a while. And that is where uh, we're making some a lot of RPG content and board games and things. Um, and so, as we mentioned in my in my uh, my intro, as you mentioned, I, I did a uh, Winter Rabbit, which is a uh, game that is was intended to sort of um, take the 4X genre of board games and kind of turn it on its head and look at it from a sort of anti-colonial kind of perspective. Um, so just a big mix of things, you know, educational games through, uh, through the K20 Center and then also, um, you know, the board game is just mostly for fun. So keeps me busy, yeah. Awesome, brilliant, thank you. Cool. Okay, so um, let's dive right in with with some of the questions uh, that we have prepared for you. So, I mean, I mean, before I do, maybe I'll kind of cue things up because when when I was chatting with Scott about this panel, the idea that education in games and also like indigenous topics in games, um, those are two kind of like things that oftentimes cross over one another or even get layered on top of one another. Um, and without making any assumptions, I'd just love to hear from you all um, in your own words, like, what would you define 
to be an educational game and what would you define to be an indigenous game? So it's kind of a two part question there. Um, whoever wants to take it. I could take a crack at it. So like for me, an educational game is something that's like trying to teach a specific topic or subject, you know, like math or English or French, whatever. Um, but then, geez, the second half of the question was what? <laughs> I'm a bit of a brain fog today. What would you describe to be def like, yeah, what would, what would an indigenous game to you be like? So the biggest thing I think is that it has to be made either by an entirely indigenous team or at least indigenous led. Like we can't have, I wouldn't describe like Assassin's Creed 3. I think I heard you talking mm -hmm. about that earlier as an indigenous game because there, I, I don't think anyway that there were indigenous artists, designers on the production team. Like their role was really like cultural consultant. <laughs> so I think to be, to qualify as an indigenous video game, like you have to have indigenous involvement from like the ground up, like mm -hmm. from the storyboarding phase, even like the conceptual yeah. phase. And that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, it's like very similar. I think an indigenous game doesn't have to necessarily include indigenous content, but as it should be made. Um, yeah, I think from the production standpoint, having indigenous uh, staff and uh, employees like the production team should be indigenous i think uh indigenous games shouldn't be limited to what people will consider as like indigenous content so i think it can expand beyond that um and then in terms of an educational game like the whole like i think educational games um yeah their goal is to the, the goal is to teach to educate um so I think, yeah, there, there's areas where I think the line gets blurry, um, but I think I'll keep that in mind for the future as the panel progresses. <laughs> so I don't stray too far from the actual question. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I, I pretty much agree with those definitions, uh, especially an indigenous game is definitely just any game made or led by an indigenous creators um it does not have to have specifically indigenous themes you know who we are and the way we think definitely informs the way we make our our art our products um you know and that's going to be true for anybody um and as far as what is an educational game i guess the pithy answer is that all games teach something you know um although some games do so much more explicitly and with much more intent you know and i think at least for the kind of things that i make a lot of them you know they become educational because we have specific objectives we're trying to hit and specific evaluations we're trying to make on those objectives but really i think you can learn from any game and so there is a middle ground there that you know that is quite blurry about what is educational and what is not yeah absolutely um what i'm what i'm pulling from all of your answers is like the two are not indigenous games and educational games there's overlap but again they're not they're not so synonymous like you can't look at an indigenous game and say oh look this is obviously setting out with the goal of like teaching me something there is learning involved oftentimes because the players that are familiar that you know are experiencing indigenous themes and narratives for the first time as spoken by by us um yeah there's a lot of learning to be had but not yeah. necessarily like yeah explicitly for like an educational first purpose yeah, so. I think it has to yep. intent. yeah intent super yeah. critical um okay i'm gonna shift to like the actual uh like where things actually are uh kind of like explicitly like <laughs> overlaid between educational and indigenous games um and i'm going to start with gahonda walks like what are you working on right now that you see that overlap kind of like happening oh geez so <sighs> There are, I don't know if necessarily I'm working on something right now because I have quite a number of things that I'm like in the process of writing grant applications for. Um, the biggest thing is we're trying to make, or Vital Software anyway, is trying to make a library of Mohawk language learning games that's going to be hopefully available for free on our website so that people from the community can play to, you know, eventually gain some type of level of fluency of the Mohawk language. Um, so I see a lot of overlap with like 
the traditionally educational game stuff and then you know it's educational because it provides perspective into like indigenous worldview which is kind of not that well known still right now where we are in society today but um yeah so there's a lot of overlap with the games that i'm designing and storyboarding right now because there's a focus on obviously indigenous storytelling specifically we're dealing with myths like the legend of the flying head the gifts of the little people um how the bear clan became medicine keepers like those type of traditional stories so like I wouldn't necessarily call like the telling of those stories an educational thing like you're just telling a myth or a legend to to somebody to the player. Um, but because it's something they haven't necessarily heard before because it's from a marginalized community, it could be considered educational in that respect. But at the same time, there are very strictly educational elements in it because like in the process of telling that story. We're going to be telling it in the Mohawk language. We're going to be engaging with like the polysynthetic nature of the language. Like the syllable means it's a girl. This is, you know, the root word, which is dog or whatever. So like those mechanics specifically, in my opinion, is what will be making it an educational game because it's trying to be like, here is how you read this particular Mohawk legend completely in Mohawk. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of fuzzy. It's a bit of a blurry line for me, like where the line is. I don't know. It's difficult to describe. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Will or Vanessa, same question for you, like in the current projects that you're working on now or projects that you've worked on in the past, like where do you see that overlap happening, like clearly between, you know, Yes, we're Indigenous making a game, but we're also making like an educational game. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah, um, if I if I can go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, so I think the the clearest example from my work is the game Winter Rabbit that I worked on, which is um, is a board game that I just sort of. So I started by looking at the the kind of 4X style board games which are out there, you know, which the 4X stands for like. Um, what is it? Explore, ex, ex uh, I don't even remember what they all are now, but explore, exploit, exterminate, expand, whatever. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, there's a in the board game space, there's a lot of very um, sort of colonial type board games that really sort of explicitly tell these colonial type stories through the way the mechanics work. And so I wanted to take something like that and while not making it explicitly like goal-driven instructional game, I wanted a game that reflected a completely different perspective. And so I looked at ways to kind of flip those mechanics on their head to make something that was about, you know, community and, you know, and managing resources rather than exploiting them and working together rather than exploitation and all of these things and kind of changing that so that through the mechanics of the game, you're making different types of decisions and playing the game in a different way. And, just thinking about the decisions you're making in a different type of way. And I think that's one of the really big overlaps because that sort of historical perspective or not even just historical perspective, but they're just a different cultural perspective um, really informed the way I put the mechanics of the game together. And that definitely changes it. So I think that is a, a, a pretty clear overlap in those things. Yeah, and I guess like from my end, I am kind of like in production, so I, it's still very new to video game making. So uh, it's been something that has been on my mind of like, what, how am I, what is my, the, the intent of language being incorporated into my game? And for me, that stems for language visibility, which is a little bit different from like traditional language learning, language revitalization. It's still categorized under. Um, but something that I noticed and from my previous experiences in like running workshops uh, with um, communities like Ganawage, uh, something that's missing is there's not enough. Um, you, we don't see and hear our languages enough uh, for us to be able to actually um, have it kind of live under our skin. So my with my game i want to i'd not necessarily focus on actually having the players 
who are playing it uh, learn a language, but rather just experience the language. Um, so how am I going to do that? Not too sure, <laughs> um, but we'll figure it out. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of where I am kind of pushing my game towards. And in a way, I guess it does overlap because for those who aren't really familiar with uh, Anishinaabe worldviews or like what yeah, and how to navigate love through an Anishinaabe lens. Um, I think it's just that itself is going to be more educational. But at the same time, if you're Anishinaabe playing it, it won't be educational. So it's really like, if this game is considered educational, well, what is who is it educational to? And like, who is making that decision to uh, name my game like that? Mm -hmm. I really want to uh, just what all of you have been talking about it really makes me want to dig into like mechanics and like also like technical decisions that have to be made when you're like scoping out a project and like why you have to make certain decisions on on design and stuff so um Vanessa if you don't mind me asking like what are some of the um like tools that you're thinking about using to create your game uh and like what how do you see players acting in the game like what kind of verbs are you going to be using to express anishinaabe love yeah, Anishina so, Anish and love anishinaabe yeah. yeah so i think it's mainly uh so i want my ideally in a best case scenario world i want to kind of have uh, the game designed to be very community based and i think some uh and based off of what my uh family so like my family does play video games once in a while and I wanted to make sure that my family could play the game that I eventually make so uh, that's where I kind of got the idea of making a farming simulator game so kind of like a Stardew Valley situation but it's Anishinaabe um, perhaps not at that big extent because it is my just the masters but um, yeah so I kind of want to make sure that when you're engaging with the community in the game and the characters that you meet in the game, that's how you form your relationships. Um, and you can build off those relationships and kind of continue growing them. And basically the more you interact with the environment in the game, the more you'll be able to understand what different areas and like how love is expressed in different um, parts. So I think for me, expressing love will like is definitely through character interaction um, and just like being able to take care of having that goal of like you need to take care. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'm going with it. Uh, and then design, um, it's also going to be based on things that is loved in community. So the design of the game is going to be pixel art, uh, mainly because pixel art is actually what you use for beating. Uh, so mm -hmm. having kind of bringing my art practice and beating into this new practice uh, is also kind of more um, a way that I can also express like my love for beadwork as well without necessarily having it in game. Wow, thank you. Oh, I'm excited to play this now. Me too. Um, <laughs> it does sound cool. Because like, yeah, you, I would say your verb there for me was like care. Like, yeah. how do you express that? And it could be many different ways. Like it could be like, gift giving you know because like in Stardew Valley like yeah, that's a really exactly. big you're part like, of that you, game where you're like giving yeah, you know you the people gifts, that you want to romance or not or just yeah. become really good friends with in the game mm -hmm. you know their special mm -hmm. items yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, yeah and I think like it's important to like when you're in making those interactions like keeping in mind like when you're playing a game for example like sometimes you won't you won't talk to all of the characters in the game right away but I think that might make a difference in my game is how many how many connections can you make? Mm. Um, so that's kind of where I want to focus it on. Super cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna jump to I'm gonna jump back to Will because uh, <laughs> sure. Will, when you were kind of describing some of the games that you've worked on, taking kind of taking a critical look at the mechanics that have been traditionally appearing appearing in um, mm -hmm. board games. Um, I'd love to hear some of like the specifics of that um, in in White Rabbit. Sure. Uh, yeah, in Winter Rabbit, it's um, so okay. Uh, for example, one of the mechanics that I have in that, and so this is a tabletop game, um, and it's sort of a worker placement game where you're going out and gathering resources. And in this game, 
uh, rather than just placing one of your, you know, your little villager tokens out to gather resources, it requires multiple. So it, you are, so the story of the game, let me back up for a second. The story of the game is that we are preparing our village for winter, but the rabbit who is the trickster has confused everyone and is just trying to sort of like take resources for himself and not really do any work. Um, so we're all a little bit mixed up. And so when you're taking these, these uh, villager tokens, you're, you're drawing them at random from a bag. It could be yours or someone else's and you're placing them out on the board. And it requires a certain number of them to be in a particular place before a certain resource gets created. So the game is competitive. We're all trying to be the most helpful to create, to prepare the village for winter, but we're also competing, you know, we're also helping each other because it requires multiple people to be out there to produce anything. Um, and you can expand the production beyond, you know, what is normally available, but that just makes it harder in later rounds to get more things. So there's this, tension of you know what do i need now versus how do i want to like sort of uh maintain the balance of things in the future so that it doesn't become harder to get later on um the main way you score points in the game is by um, helping other people by creating tasks for other people so you put out a little tick card that represents a task that you need done another player can pay some resources to do it for you and then you get a benefit because they helped you but then the player that did it gets some points toward winning the game so everything are these very sort of friendly interactions that can still be competitive, but aren't about, you know, extracting as much resource from the environment as possible. You know, if you extract too much resource, you can't hold it, and then the rabbit gets it, and then you can steal it back from the rabbit later, or he might show up and steal more from you. And there's this constant dynamic of trying to balance, you know, getting what you need to do the tasks you want to do, but not getting too much and not making things too hard, and then also just getting everything done by the time winter arrives because if winter arrives without the village being prepared then it's a mutual lose condition everybody loses the game um so i tried to take a lot of those mechanics that you know you normally see in euro games and just change the perspective in that way so that there's a little bit more um not complete cooperation but collaboration and um and balance built into it super cool so yeah helping is would be like the adverb that I would use mm -hmm. to describe like that core mechanic. Uh, super interesting. Do you feel like, <laughs> do you feel like players can help too much in that game? Like you feel like it can get into a place where it's like unhealthy, where, you know, they're not balancing their like own individual needs or is the game kind of limited in that scope where it's like, <laughs> like the, the goal is to only commit, uh, like uh, contribute to the community just so that the trickster doesn't the, <laughs> yeah. too much havoc. The, um, the scoring mechanics are balanced in such a way that that's hard to happen, but I've definitely seen different play styles. You definitely see some groups that come in and everybody is sort of talking a lot and collaborating a lot. And then other groups that are completely just bluffing and messing with each other and throwing rabbit tokens down to mess each other up and, get a lot more competitive, but it, it, it's fun either way. And it's interesting to see the dynamics of like how things come together, depending on how the players go, go, go about it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and on the same token, it, it's difficult for one player to completely tank the game. It'll make things harder for everybody else. But um, you know, if one player wants everybody to lose and everybody else is still working together, you can still make it, you know? So, you know, I'm sure there are edge cases where people can kind of, kind of go off the rails but um for the most part you know the the incentives are built up to to make it to where you know helping is good great thank you and gahonda walks with your with your language learning games what do you see being like the the primary action that players are taking in that experience so there's two main things that we've kind of designed into the game like you open the app, whatever it's going to be, and it gives you the option to have like story mode or practice mode. And depending on which one you select, you can either like you're in practice mode and you're learning like the base vocabulary that you would need to understand the specific legend that is trying to be told to you. And like you have all these exercises of like how to conjugate that root word, because I don't know how familiar you guys are with, you know, Mohawk stuff, but <laughs> they're like words can be they're basically sentences like my name Gahondawax, for example is a whole sentence that means a shaker of the field or she moves with the grass 
is another version I've also heard of my name. So like you need those little explanations of like, this is the syllable that makes it feminine. This is like the root word. And this is like conveys the tense of the word. So there's all those kinds of vocabulary exercises. Uh, but then in story mode, you can just sit back and have the entire legend narrated to you by like a voice actor who would ideally be like an elder or a first language speaker, because there are a lot of us that don't have the opportunity to have the language spoken to us at home, especially. And something that I do in my family a lot is like it's either myself or one of my siblings reading to my my beautiful young niece Mia <laughs> before bed. And obviously, because I'm not a speaker or none of my siblings are either, like we can't read to her Mohawk. And I remember even when I was in immersion school as a young child, we had lots of Mohawk books laying around and I would pick them up and be like, this is not what I am learning in class. <laughs> because like the first things you're taught about Mohawk is like the root word vocabulary. So like there's kind of a baby version of a way to speak Mohawk where you're using words like ee, ize, zawahione, like just this word has a direct translation before you get into like the complicated conjugation and all that sort of thing. So like that was the level of fluency we had, but the books that were in the classroom were the big complicated like adult version words mm. that I would read and be like, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> so I was envisioning a game that would kind of address that need that I had when I was a kid, like wishing there had been an explanation of like, this is how the language works. And so, you know, on top of the, education I was getting of the base vocabulary. So yeah, those are the two things that I'm oh, designing into my game. That's brilliant. Yeah, so often, I mean, I've <laughs> done the Gunyan Geha 101 uh, through Native Montreal and like just the, yeah, it's like so regimented, like there are just so many things that you need to learn mm -hmm. just to form the base of like understanding of how the language works. You don't even get to those like in context stories or even phrases even. So to know that you're working on something that'll put those roots into those big, you know, stories that are linked together through multiple words that are huge. Um, but, but again, then like add that additional sub uh, information or additional information um, that, place, that places it all in context is something that mm -hmm. I, w I wish I had when I was <laughs> yeah. doing my, my Mohawk language learning. Super yeah. cool. Okay, um, I just wanna take a pause here and remind the folks that are tuning in on Zoom and the folks in the audience uh, in person that uh, you're welcome to raise your hand and ask a question to our panelists. You can post a question in the chat as well. We have uh, the chat open on the desk here, so I'll know when, when stuff comes in. Um, but I'm hoping to switch gears now and kind of get you folks talking to one another a little bit more. Um, has anything kind of like come to the surface for any of you when you've heard your, your colleagues speak? Yeah. Um, just like about, I mean, yeah, talking about roots and how words connect, like with my, like my background in linguistics, like that's all I learned was how to like, oh, like this is a root, this is this. And, um, I think like, uh, yeah, going into kind of language learning, um, that I think once that's something that I have to kind of kind of switch gears into for my own game because when we're looking at kind of relationality and care, for example, a lot of that is actually like embedded in the language. For mm -hmm. example, when you're talking to someone in Nishinaabemowin, you have to um, if you if I talk about you, I have to within like the sentence itself, it will tell me who you're related to and who all your connections are. Um, I can't just refer to someone as like a one person. It has to be a person who is like a sister to someone or, oh, yeah. So it has to be so in cool. relationality. Um, so that's like something in initiative one that I think could be really cool or really interesting to like present within a game and mm -hmm. how, and just kind of like figuring out how I can do that in terms of where that fits in like dialogue or like interactions. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of that delving into linguistics, like I'm very happy that I have a bit of a background in it. So it's not totally alien to me. Um, but at the same time, it is a bit uh, like I know so much about linguists, like the linguistics of Anishinaabemowin, but I don't actually know the language. Mm. Right. So it's mm -hmm. very like kind of making the game for me as well is almost like a journey of trying to learn the language myself yeah. as well. Yeah. So 
um, yeah, I was like, when you were mentioned, I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. totally get it. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of aggravating, <laughs> honestly, at times, because there's so many things I want to make, but I can only go at the pace that I'm learning the language yeah. at. So sometimes I feel like I'm holding other imaginary people that are waiting for my games to be released back. So I feel that pressure of like, oh, I've got to learn faster so I can make games so more people can learn. And it feels like this endless cycle of like, Mm -hmm. I've got to work harder. I've got to learn faster. And it's difficult to balance that with like, I'm a human being. I need to take <laughs> breaks. I can't be expected to learn things yeah. like, you know, overnight. Yeah, so that's an interesting challenge. It just make it just has me wanting to make a statement that like for indigenous game developers, you know, whether it's digital or physical in the case of board games, like all of you, and I'll speak for myself as well here too, like there's so much intentionality and, and individuality, like in terms of your own experience and worldviews that are being put into these things that goes unseen unless you're, you're talking about it and, and, and noting it when, you know, when you're developing mm -hmm. your project, right? Um, where do you see that happening for you, Will? Like, how do you see your your experiences as you know a Cherokee person um, influencing your your design and, and your productions? Um, it definitely falls into everything that I think about in 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 some fashion or another, you know. And sometimes it's it's in very like overt and intentional ways, like Winter Rabbit. And sometimes it's you know um, a little more subtle, you know. Like there's plenty of games that I've made that are for you know just general high school classrooms where you know maybe I'm just considering you know the perspective of making sure that there's diversity in this game, you know, and it's something as simple as that. Whereas there's other things that I'm you know thinking of, you know, writing a role playing game, and I'm just thinking of things that are like not strictly you know medieval europe tolkien kind of things you know like it can be a very huge wide variety of things um you know and in any particular project i think it it pops around a lot of in different things you know and I, I i i do appreciate what you guys are talking about language too and it makes me think a lot about that because you know i definitely would love to work on a cherokee language game so cherokee is also a very polysynthetic language um like I guess Mohawk and Anishinaabin are, um, and um, there's you know resources out there, but there there can always be so many more and so many different ways of learning that stuff, and it would be really cool to work on something like that and to have those things um, have those things available. Um, but even just you know including language within a game, even if it's not um, explicitly about learning the language, I think is great um, and something that I've been trying to do a little bit as well, but. Um, it's such a broad question. It's really hard to like nail down any particular singular thing because um, yeah, I'm thinking about stuff like that all the time, you know, thinking about how the types of decisions you're making in a game reflect the the type of gameplay you want, or, you know, like what story is it telling? Cause the story is told through the narrative of the game, but it's also told through, through the, the decisions that the player makes and the types of decisions that are available to them. Um and, you know, every game can set that up in certain ways to make you play a certain type of character or give you certain types of incentives. Um, so just being aware of those things and aware of the, the ways that those can affect people um, and can affect gameplay and tell a different type of story. Um, you know, I'm just, it's just something to constantly be thinking about, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Absolutely. All right, so from one big question to, to the next, why games? Why is it the medium that you're using? Because, you know, education can come in many different forms. It can come through reading a book. It can come through going on a field trip and experiencing something like a, an exhibition like we're, we have in this space here. It can also come from watching a documentary film or even a piece of fiction. Um, why is it that games are such a draw for you three? Uh, yeah, I guess I, for me, it's more like, it kind of stems from my own kind of how I've always seen media, not really seeing myself in these 
uh, forms. So like growing up and watching movies, I never really saw Anishinaabe movies or like if I do see natives in movies, it's always something's up one way or another, you know? Uh, it's not really, or like it's based in the past or and even in the past, you're like, what nation is this? Like they have TVs and other things. Like what's going on here? Like no idea. Don't know who they're presenting, but uh, but yeah. So for me, it was kind of like stemming from that, stemming from my own frustration and anger and kind of just figuring out like, okay, I have all this energy and it's not in a really good spot right now. Um, so I've always played video games. I'm super into it. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of was like, why don't I just make a video game instead? Because there's a lot of books. Nishina, uh, Nishina is, uh has a lot of resources for learning languages. So like the University of Minnesota, for example, has a really, really successful program for language learning. Um, so that wasn't really where I wanted to go into is I and like in linguistics itself, I was like, well, I'm not really into like super heavy theory and like just I wanted to kind of be more creative with how I want to present things so for me it came naturally to have like a video game or at least see things that I like in the language so like one of my initial ideas was to like dub like anime or whatever and like I saw um like there has actually been some movement in that mm -hmm. but um and then uh yeah I kind of wound up I was like you know what I'm gonna make a video game um, and the intent of my video game is not to learn the language, it's to experience it. And I think that's something that's like a huge gap that's missing, especially for folks who are like, for example, like when you're a kid from age, like when basically when you're born to like around 18, 19, like that's your kind of prime time learning language. And if you miss or like, once you get past that, it gets really harder. It's much harder to learn languages. Like when you're in university taking a language course, you're like, actually, this is, this is pretty hard. Um, yeah. And like learning how to memorize and you're like, I have to memorize conjugations and like actually force yourself to think about how language is working. And for a lot of people, like you take a German class and you can just start watching German movies or like play games in German. But for Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Moen, it's not the same. So like you don't have movies, you don't have games. So just being able to experience a language and immerse yourself in a language actually makes you learn it in ways that um, aren't, isn't necessarily like in your face, what is the verb, what is this? So that's kind of how I wanted to approach language learning is filling in the gaps of like the resources that are out there for just experiencing language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely something I wish I had more of when I was a kid, because mm -hmm. I don't know how much of it I mentioned in my interview or already said, but like, I would go to school, right, and I would be in the Mohawk immersion class, but then I would come home and I'm like watching anime in English, I'm like reading Harry Potter in English and talking to my siblings in English and like the only resources, there are a lot of written resources, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like Mohawk for beginners, there's Mohawk dictionaries, I have like three Mohawk dictionaries at home, but I don't have any Mohawk movies. I don't have any Mohawk video games other than the ones I've made myself or like other indigenous people have made. So like, if you have the capability to be making these games and you're like passionate about it, you should be making these games because it's never going to be a waste of time because we need the resources. <laughs> we need it everywhere. We need to be on TV. We need to be in video games. We need to be on the radio if people are going to learn because, you know, it's difficult to pull off immersion and that's why it's so exclusive to get into especially adult oriented immersion programs because like we have to manufacture an environment for people to be immersed in because we don't even have that option in our own homes anymore which is you know crappy <laughs> is the right word i will use yeah i i love that you guys are doing so much work with language um that's really great you know and it makes me think about you know when i was a kid and i rarely ho heard cherokee spoken you know, around around town and things. And then now there's so many more resources. There's animations, there's online classes, there's immersion school. I got friends whose kids, they speak to them in Cherokee, even though the, my friends themselves never grew up speaking it, you know. Um, and it's great seeing all that progress. And I think games definitely can be a, a huge part of that. I think games have a huge potential and capability for learning. Um, they're not the be all end all. There's definitely other forms of education that have benefits in certain situations and 
you know, not everything needs to be an educational game, but educational games can do a lot. The power of of engagement, of allowing, you know, learners, players to try things and fail and try again to experiment and explore. There's just this huge space there that I think I think a lot of that draws me to it, that ability to explore and just see what can happen if you try things and learn in that very kind of constructivist way that other forms really don't allow for um i think that's great you know and a lot of times i think about um the nature of storytelling so you know telling a story is really a interactive experience you know it's an experience for everybody involved the audience is part of that um you know and this is true if you're telling you know traditional stories or if you're going to a play you know but if you're reading something from a book or watching a movie it's much more passive you're just you're just there consuming what is given to you. And I think that video games and role-playing games and things like that in a way are a bit closer to our traditional ways of telling stories than just consuming passive media, you know, because it it is, you are more involved. You're experiencing it in a way that only exists while you're experiencing it. You know, a video game isn't really doing anything unless you're or a board game or whatever, you know, it's not doing anything unless you're playing it. The, the, the story gets created through the play. Um, and I think that is a really important part of it because again, you know, we're talking about experiencing these things in the real world, even if, or, you know, in a virtual world, maybe, you know, through some sort of manufactured environment, if it has to be, but still experiencing them. And um this is just a medium that can do that like nothing else, you know? Mm -hmm. That interactivity element, the sense of player ownership. I'm even thinking too of like, not even necessarily video games or board games, but like D&D &D and tabletop yep. games. And like the players are contributing to the story almost as much, if not more than a dungeon master typically because a dungeon master's responsibility is kind of like how do i keep the rules you know, <laughs> on the track and you know nothing too wild of happening i mean it depends on your dm but um they're kind of just setting the scenario and then letting the players play and have that and like build that sense of ownership yep. you know, live um kind of in, um, improvisationally you yeah. know because they don't know generally don't know the scenarios beforehand and, so, so you know um yeah i see that happening a lot too um with certain types of games uh, from a, a video game medium. Um, but, you know, those games take so much <laughs> resources to design and to, um, you know, to create, um, which is kind of where I wanted to, to take it next. And this will be my, my last big question for all of you before we move into audience questions. So audience, <laughs> please send me your questions. But um, yeah, I want to talk about like resources, like as, all independent game makers what is it like on the production side like taking taking the design and all of the like you know artistic things that you have to put into a game what about the logistical things like what does it mean to operate you know revital software mm -hmm. what does it mean to be an an mfa student like <laughs> making their first game what is it like <laughs> being um Will, who has <laughs> his hand in many different types of games um, and experiences, what what is that all like for you guys? Yeah, to juggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like on the one hand, I feel very strongly about making language learning games, but I also have a very strong desire to make games that are just for fun, like something that I could play with my niece without having to think like, oh, this is a language learning game that I am playing with my niece because my language is like one or two generations away from being completely extinct. Like I would love to play an entertainment indigenous video game that like is free from the, you know, the daily difficult topics that I'm confronted with all the time. Like I, I would love to play a game that's a space for me to just be indigenous without that necessarily being like an inherently traumatic thing, yeah. <laughs> you know? I just want to relax. I want to farm. I want to like play a dating sim. I want to pull my radishes out of the ground and go back to my house and like <laughs> make a stew. Yeah, so it's like a big pull of like, I want to rest, but there's so much work to do. <laughs> so that's one of the, the challenges for me is like 
balancing my sense of responsibility with my sense of, you know, relax, take care of yourself. It's okay. <laughs> so that's one part of it for me. So that, that pressure. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think for me, it's really like entering the, it's just like a slow unfolding of like peeling the onion and seeing like, oh, there's actually quite a lot I got to do. Yeah. So I'm hoping to eventually build a little team up to help me out. But uh, yeah, I think for me, it's just been, yeah, kind of like what you were mentioning of just like, I just want to experience and just be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to constantly be on like the political front of like having to justify my existence to everyone. I just want to chill out. I just want to chill out. Just want to um, exist, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, is making the game a chill experience? Mm, debatable. But eventually I'll get there. <laughs> but yeah, I think like, yeah, entering my MFA and like just kind of realizing all the stuff I have to do is really daunting, but I do have a very supportive team. So I'm really excited. I feel that. I feel like as Indigenous folks, like oftentimes <laughs> so much of our life is taken up with just like the act of educating, like, mm -hmm. and, and not in, in any sort of like people demanding our, our knowledge in any sort of malicious way. It's just like how it's going. Like Indigenous topics are front of mind for a lot of people in Canada, the US, yeah. all over the world, but like they just don't know where yeah. to start. And oftentimes it's like the know. people that are just there yeah. <laughs> um, that are bearing the brunt of like, those requests so yeah. i can't tell you the amount take of care times of yourself <laughs> i got a facebook message from a friend like as their mm -hmm. one indigenous friend like hey could you tell me more about this and i'm like yes i can <laughs> i can Absolutely. welcome to my ted talk here's I, the crash yeah. course on the ochre crisis <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I want to be clear that like these questions and these requests should keep coming yeah but also to stay cognizant of like you know there's a lot of these requests coming and yeah. you're not the only yeah. one sometimes so yeah and like it's, it's fine it's just we need to practice our boundary setting that's yeah all. exactly yeah. it's i think boundary setting is difficult for a lot of us because you want to be educating people and i said before it's like difficult to balance the sense of responsibility with like okay this is me time right now because yeah. there is a sense of urgency like time is running out right now <laughs> yeah so, there's like yeah. that urgency and then there's just like being a good friend and being like yes i will yeah. tell you and then you don't realize towards like the end you're like actually i'm exhausted right now yeah like i have to like actually think of how to formulate and say it and yeah doing it repeating it over and over like at one point like even just like going through school like you learn pretty sure i can like recite the indian act by now yeah Oh I think God. every class I took, we had to go over the Indian Act. And I was like, mm. all right, like, here we go again. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, making sure we have, like, yeah, prioritizing your own space um, and just making sure that you have that kind of support group. I think that's super important to have mm -hmm. um, so you're not alone. Yeah. I think that's my, that's my biggest challenge right now is I used to do everything alone. So yes. been there. <laughs> actually having to like talk to people and being like, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Who knows? Yeah. But yeah. That's my biggest challenge right now. It's just like realizing that like you, it's not, not, yeah, you don't have to be alone in it anymore. And I think that's super important. Yeah. And also that like, there's a lot of resources out there now that have a lot of this yeah. information that people are asking me for like you don't have to hear it necessarily from an indigenous mouthpiece you could like find an article written by an indigenous person <laughs> like there's wikipedia out there now that's being edited by indigenous people all of these things like i understand wanting to get it from the source but like then i feel like i get nervous like Am I giving accurate information? Do I know enough? Am I the right person to be having this conversation with? Or am I just like a native person that might know more than you? <laughs> so, no. I don't know. Sometimes I feel stressed out. Like, what if I've had this conversation with somebody and I told them something that was wrong and they're going to take that as like the standard for the entire, you know, Mohawk community. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I feel so, that. Go ahead, purposely well. spread yeah. misinformation. Just in terms of what it's like being you. 
is my last <laughs> question. Me? I, sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate the question. What is it like being you and, you know, setting the goals of, of creating these things that mm -hmm. you obviously have a passion to create? Um, where are your resource? Uh, where, I guess, where are you wealthy in resources and where are you lacking in resources? Because for right. me personally, like, when I set out to make my game a few years ago, it was like, whoa, like, there's just so much time and money and thought that goes into this that I, I basically didn't play games for a year because I was so in my own that the last thing I wanted to do on my free time was like play. Right. <laughs> I was like, I just need to turn my brain off and not think about games. <laughs> So yeah. that's maybe me projecting, but um, <laughs> no, no <laughs> that, that's real. You. Yeah. Like, what are you, what are you kind of going through? Right yeah, now? that's real. I mean, time, time and the mental energy just to keep up with it is the hard part. You know, um, my day job, I have the, you know, I have the benefit of having, you know, a team of programmers and artists and people that I work with and all of that, but it's also not, you know, I'm making games that are, you know, right now we're working on an app for college tours, which is great. It's awesome. You know, it's a really important, useful thing, but it's not also not, you know, my passion, you know, but I'm glad that I get to work on that. And then I have the opportunity to work on, um, on software that is really good and useful to a lot of kids, you know, but um, then on the side, that's why I started the, the board game um, stuff because, you know, I can do a lot of it myself. You know, I can do a lot of the graphic design myself. I can do the prototyping myself, you know, and I've got a, um, I've got a business partner that helps like having a community of people that I can get together with to talk about game design and having, you know, people to kind of help with all the little nuts and bolts of running a Kickstarter campaign is essential. I could not do it by myself for sure, you know? Um, and then the slow process of learning all of those things on top of all of the other things that I'm constantly working on and doing is a lot because just learning to manage a project and, um, market a project and produce it on top of designing and you know um working with contractors and all of those things it's a it's a lot so you know just the the time and the yeah the mental capacity to just to keep up with it all is challenging sometimes you know it's it's quite a lot um and then you know i same thing that you guys said too you know just Having people, you know, people see, you know, I've got Cherokee text written on the cards for Winter Rabbit and having to explain every single time what that means, you know, which is great because it's part of part of the game and part of what I want people to experience. But also, you know, I'm just constantly re-explaining why this is a thing and why this exists and why, you know, other games are the way they are. And it's, you know, it's a lot of re-explaining the same stuff over and over. But um, then people play the game and they have a good time and they're like, this is like nothing I've ever experienced. And that is just completely fulfilling and, and worth it, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. What you just kind of ended on there. I feel like all of us have either, either, either have, or, or aspiring to create something that, you know, no one's ever experienced before. So mm -hmm. that's, I'll, I'll leave that kind of just in the air for a little bit um, and kind of pass it over to our audience for, for questions. Yes, you in the blue shirt. <laughs> it's Scott, the organizer of this panel. <laughs> All event. It should be good, it should be good, hi. Um, I mean, I'm being a bit selfish because I also am the one that really wanted this panel to exist and so I'm really glad that it could, so I'm definitely gonna ask you guys questions while you're here. Um, so first off, great conversation, I really appreciate it and like, Hopefully some people can ask some questions in the chat. I don't know if you as panelists have been able to see some of these things in the chat, but I've been able to kind of look at a few things and a lot of it looks really positive and that's great to see. Um, one of the things that hit me as you were all talking um, around kind of education and games and, uh, and being indigenous devs as yourselves is that it seems that like the point of education is not just in the final product, but it's in like the creation of the product where all of you seem to be kind of learning a lot in your process, but then you're also kind of becoming these educators to the world around you as you're in that process. And so there's kind of like three kind of parts that I'm seeing you all stress on as you're talking about it, which I think is really interesting and really powerful. So thank you for kind of like making me think about that a little bit more. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a very specific question for you, Will. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the screen. I don't know if you actually were talking, but I'm looking at you via video. <laughs> okay. And because um, 
you're doing work on like tabletop and we touched on it a little bit in the conversation that was happening, but I'm really curious about how you kind of see the analog genres compared to like video game genres as spaces that can kind of um, be really uh, speaking to kind of like the indigenous themes that you want to talk to. Mm -hmm. so like what, where do you see kind of the value and points of like these analog or, or non-digital uh, themes and spaces? Well, I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest things I like about analog is the social aspect. It forces people to get together around a table to like look at each other and physically interact. And that is a thing that, uh, you know, you can have multiplayer video games and things, but it's not quite the same. I love the physicality of it. I love people getting around and, um, you know, interacting with each other in person. And I think that is definitely something that has a lot of benefit in any kind of education or interaction. Um, and the types of emergent narrative you can pull out of that I think are are pretty fantastic. Um, but yeah, that social aspect I think is one of the one of the biggest parts of it, um, for me anyway. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And then I had a second question, if, which I'm going to be selfish and ask, um, but again, people can raise their hands and or add in the chat if they have more questions. Um, but there was a brief mention at the start about Assassin's Creed and the introduction of um, an indigenous space in there. And I'm curious when we're talking about like education in terms of like educating individuals about indigenous issues and indigenous culture, and indigenous language. When we think AAA titles, like what's the best kind of way moving forward? Is it that they have like fully integrated spaces for indigenous voices to be heard? Because um, you mentioned that, like, you know, true indigenous the game is one from the ground up, right? And so where can we kind of find common grounds for the AAA, the big titles that we know, like the general population are more likely to pick up and play? Is there a space there for collaboration? And what does that space kind of look like? Um, and anyone can answer that as it's kind of a big question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think there's definitely space for collaboration, but something I would really love to see is like big AAA studios offering like mentorship opportunities to indigenous youth or even like asking communities like what type of game do you need right now? What can we help you with? Because I think in a lot of these scenarios, we know what we want or need but we don't necessarily have the expertise or like the number of people that are trained to make these things. So like that's where big AAA studios can come in and like supplement and teach because, you know, ideally at the end of the day, indigenous people want to be making our own resources to help our own people. And we just need a little bit of help to do that sometimes because if you're talking about language learning games, which I love to do because that's what I do. <laughs> Like there's not a lot of overlap between people that are interested in making language learning games that like have the skills to make video games and like are indigenous. So there's, you know, there's got to be some type of collaboration in there. And that's what I'm interested to see from yeah. AAA studios. Yeah. And like you can kind of see it too. like some AAA studios, you can see glimpses of collaboration, like you can see glimpses of like, you know, you have a uh, yeah, you see those glimpses of collaboration and just how those can expand, like like what you're saying, like an internship program included in the build of the game as mm -hmm. well. Like, you know, it'd be nice to see these AAA studios being able to just have these indigenous stories, but they need to do the work as well to bring in those indigenous storytellers yeah. um, and not have to have all these requirements to be able to tell a story. So yeah being able to have that mentorship program being more open and more willing to hire uh indigenous creators mm -hmm. um because that's what's missing in these studios is if you want to diversify your games you're gonna have to diversify your uh employees yeah a little bit right yeah. so um yeah going into those games like when you're making these you know, you want to step away from just consultant mm -hmm. and just go straight into, well, you're no longer a consultant, you're actually the storyboarder. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. let's pull you like someone who does artwork. Well, we'll put you into the concept art yeah. team and like you can really like learn how to make concept art, have those artists help you as well. And like those mentorship programs, like it's not taking away that kind of like opportunity, but it's actually just growing it a lot and just you're going to be able, like it's just inspiring for a yeah. lot of people is like it's empowering as well to be able to say like yes i did actually work on this and yeah 
exactly. I actually did do something that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think they should be looking at, yeah, more collaboration and like paid collaboration and not just contributor. I think, yeah. you know, that was something maybe 10 years ago, five years ago or something, but like we're past that now. Yeah. We don't. We're ready for the next yeah. thing. <laughs> and I think another key point is like, when AAA studios are approaching indigenous communities to potentially collaborate on a game, I don't think they should be approaching the community with the attitude of like, how do your legends or your stories or your culture fit into this brand I've already created? Yeah. Like, I'm not interested in that. I'm ready for you to come to me and tell me what game do you want to make for your community, <laughs> right? Like, we need to be there writing the stories, like deciding what the games are going to be about and not like bending over backwards to make our mythologies fit into a brand you've already yeah. created. And I think it also just like makes the game better. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a Western way of telling stories and then there's other methods of telling stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, so we'll have a lot of interest in like Eastern versions of storytelling, but it's not the same as indigenous ways of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Anishinaabe storytelling, you know, you have like your, you have certain points and like things that happen, but how we get to those points and how we get to those things can be different between each storyteller. Yep. But at the end of the day, you're still learning the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so I that think it's yeah diverse. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the AAA studios need to, and I have hope that they will come to realize that there is benefit to them in diversity. You know, there's a benefit in, to them in telling stories in different ways and showing different stories. If you look at examples from like film and TV, things like Prey, which was fantastic, and Reservation Dogs and these other shows that you see completely different types of stories that you don't get from, you know, the normal channels, you know, that this media comes out of. And as these big studios start to realize, and I do believe that they will eventually, that these kind of that having diverse storytellers, diverse creative people in all capacities artists, you know, storyboarders, designers, writers, programmers, everything, you know, that you'll get new things and audiences will respond to those new things and then they will benefit, you know, on their own business from bringing in diverse um diverse talent, you know, and diverse perspectives and um yeah, I I I do I I do see that happening in the future and I think it might be slow and I know there'll be setbacks. But it is ultimately beneficial to the companies themselves as well as the communities that are being represented. Um, yeah. On to us. Yeah. That was that was kind of like my <laughs> like one <laughs> quippy like contribution to this discussion. Is just like there needs to be more funding happening with like little to no strings attached. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the next step. Because we see, because we see things like cultural consultation with Assassin's Creed Three, we see cultural co uh, community collaboration with things like Never Alone. But on the indie scale, I think the next step is like really like pitching to publishers, getting studios like Revital Software funded to make the project that you want to make. Yeah. And yeah, the, the I think sometimes the tricky thing is like fitting what publishers want, which is revenue in with the values that, you know, we bring and our communities bring to the table, which is like, yeah, you know, language revitalization, health, you know, knowledge uh, sharing and uh, revitalization as well. So it's tricky. I will say, I will plug uh, a project that is upcoming, um, Hill Agency, Purity and Decay by Megan Burns' team, um, yeah. the Chima Stawastan Games, based in Hamilton, Ontario. Megan's studio has gotten a pretty like decent chunk of funding from like AAA oh, wow. um, publishers to to make that a reality. Definitely not enough to like make a whole game, mm -hmm. um, but you know it's something, right? Yeah, uh, I think it was yeah. the Ubisoft one of the Ubisoft award, like grant awards kind of things last year. So, you know, it's, it's something, but it's, it's also like not far enough ultimately yeah. in terms of what it takes to, to making games, like so much money and time and people <laughs> goes yeah. into it. Yeah. I almost feel like AAA studios are shy or like afraid of giving that kind of funding because 
there are a lot of instances, or at least I know a lot of instances of like people working on a project for over four years or even longer. And like, in my opinion, they're probably very concerned with like, when is this game going to be done so we can put it out there so it'll be on social media so people can play it and they'll be like, oh my God, this was a Ubisoft project. This was a Blizzard project. This was whatever project where like they're investing more in like, when do we get to show off the fact that we supported you in this project instead of like uplifting the, the studio or the, the creators yeah. themselves. Yeah, and in those ways, you know, maybe going through AAA isn't, isn't what it's gonna be, you know, maybe coming up and creating our own companies or finding funding from other sources is, is how it's, we're gonna get there because, you know, the AAAs, as big companies, they're going to be shy of anything that's a risk, anything they perceive as a risk or a change. They're they're going to be careful about that because that's that's what they do. You know, they'll just make another Assassin's Creed game or whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, we can't necessarily rely on them. I do hope that they progress. But, yeah, they're not necessarily what we can rely on to get where we need to go and where we want to go. So I technically have another question, but I realize that me asking lots of questions might be stopping someone from raising their hand or asking a question like via the Zoom. So I will like wait a second. And if someone actually has a question they would like to ask, please go ahead and ask it because I can ask questions all day long to these people. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's maybe not why everyone else is here. And so I don't want to hold you all hostage. Um, so this is an open invitation for anyone tuning in online to raise their hand and uh, jump in and ask a question. Yeah. I'm just like looking at the team on the Zoom. It looks like there's no hand just yet. Let's let's wait another 10 seconds. We'll wait 10 seconds, yeah. We'll I know for me sounds. personally, it takes some time to like yeah. psych myself up to unmuting <laughs> on a big call like this. <laughs> I also just live for like awkward Zoom silences because people get very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very I think we have a question. Excellent. Hello uh, there. Would you be able to quickly introduce yourself and, and ask your question? Sure. So my name is Scott Nicholson. I'm a professor of game design at Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, where our program focuses on making games to change the world, focusing on games that make a difference. Um, and I'm curious, everything you've been talking about so far are games from sort of our Western European viewpoint of games. And I'm curious, are uh, what structures of storytelling or gameplay uh, have you experienced from your own cultures that, that we haven't seen? Interesting question. <laughs> hmm. I have to think on that for a second. <laughs> Collect my thoughts. Yeah. Um, so what I do know of traditional games, um, at least among the Cherokee, there are a lot of sporting events. You know, we've got our own form of stickball, um, a few other, you know, sporting events like that that were traditional games. There's um, a handful of just sort of games of chance that go into it. And I'm working on a role playing game that like takes one of the, like a traditional dice game and, and uses it as part of the mechanics for the role playing game. So kind of importing that in there. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's tough to say because I honestly don't know a lot of, you know, traditional games that kind of poured over to the sort of games we're talking about. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I almost have an answer brewing and I'll see if I can string it together. Um, so if we're talking about like educational games, there's like a particular way to teach, you know, two plus two is four, or like this important historical event happened on this date at this place with this guy involved at this time of day. But then if you want to, I think, engage with a more indigenized way of storytelling, you would focus more on like the impact that event had on the community or particular individuals like this is how that historical event like for the example I can think of off the top of my head is like I can talk about uh, the date the Oka crisis started and who got arrested and when the barricades went up or I can tell the story of what life was like on the reservation when my mother was living through it you know like it's more of a focus on creating, I think, 
empathy or personal mm -hmm. connections with the subject matter that you're trying to teach instead of like these are the facts you know this is like the ingredients that yeah. made that event instead of this is like the reality of this person living through it you know that was directly affected by it yeah yeah i think so. like uh i'm actually not too familiar with traditional games in my community um but when we do play games something i always like to do when i do go up and i'm like the awkward youngest person in the room and I have to figure out how to talk to my elders. Something I like to do is tell them to teach me a card game. Oh, cool. And I think that's a really great way of just learning how they think um, the games they know and then also getting like beat pretty hard by my elder yeah. in the card game. And you're like, yeah. And then you learn as well. It's like, that's a humbling. Ex it's like, a, yeah, you're, you're humbled. Um, but that's part of the teaching is humility mm -hmm. and like letting someone guide you instead so i think like even if it's not a traditional game i think just by the way it's told and the way we're going about it is going to be different from like you know if you learn a card game you're just like told all the rules and then okay let's play but like when you're learning a card game one time i was learning it with an elder and then they weren't telling me the rules i was like Okay, I gotta learn. I gotta learn the rules fast. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I got beat pretty hard. Um, but yeah, so that I always find it fun. And then you get to have that really interesting interaction with like, yeah, you just have like multi generational interaction. And I think that's something that Western societies don't necessarily do anymore mm -hmm. is, you know, having friends from different generations and learning from them and having a conversation and learning what they did when they were like 25 versus mm -hmm. what I was doing when I was 20, like when I'm 25 or yeah. yeah. So I think just the interaction of playing games is just so, I think would be, it's just interesting to look at from like, yeah, learning and what, what am I actually learning? Is it the rules of the game or is it how to, coexist yeah yeah the conversation that comes along with the game or after the game is just as important as the game itself and yeah and those interactions with people and ideas of you know ideas of sportsmanship and things too how even if the even if the competition gets really really competitive you know afterwards it's still coming back together you're still a community you know you're not you know holding grudges you're not trying to destroy anyone you're just you know Competing, you know, and competing to your best and then coming together. So I think those attitudes towards towards the game are also important um, to kind of point out. Thanks, Scott. I can ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Avery. Um, All right. Um, I'm Avery uh, Rube. I make uh, uh, learning games, uh, social impact games, or however you want games to change the world, whatever you want to call them in a small uh, studio here in Montreal. And one of the things that we uh, struggle with a little bit or we find difficult, I mean, a lot of things are difficult in video games, but is the idea of like getting the game to users, whether that's through marketing or if it's, um, if it's uh, uh, like a, a learning game, you know, finding the right partners to uh, get the game to schools, for instance, or working with a museum to get the game into a museum. What has, uh, worked for some of your games and some of the, the the new projects you're working on. Like, what are the what are the different I don't know strategies or what kind of ideas you have to to kind of get the message out that your game is a super cool game, but there's also a little bit more to it because it has a, a different way that it was made or a different kind of perspective on mm -hmm. on, on on a specific subject. How is how are you getting that message across? I'm assuming it's not easy to get across because it's just hard to get across these messages, but what have you learned and what has worked for you? And um, I would love to learn from you from about this. Yeah, I think I can talk about that a little bit. Um, working, so uh, working directly with teachers, you know, making partners in schools with teachers and administrators is a, is a big part of that. If you're going for, you know, um, public education, you know, higher ed or middle, whatever, public education, um, type audiences, um, making sure that, that they understand how it benefits them. So um, 
I, I assume it's similar in Canada, but, you know, here we have, you know, state standards that teachers have to follow in their classrooms and showing them that our games are tied directly to those standards that they can, um, you know, that they can go to their administrators or whoever and say, hey, this is, you know, this applies directly to this thing I'm teaching. That helps. Um, I've also found that, you know, making sure that they are easily accessible to everybody on the types of devices they have definitely necessary and making sure that they're free. Like even if we sell a game for a dollar, <laughs> schools will not pick it up, you know, even as, as cheap as it could be possibly be um, and making sure it's free. But yeah, there's just a lot of like groundwork of like getting out and making partners with schools and teachers. Um, and that's been like the, the best thing for us, you know, and then of course we do get people like randomly picking up some of our games, you know, all over the world, but um but our, our highest concentration are just finding out what teachers really need in their classrooms and building things that specifically address those needs. And then you know, just do you do you tell the story that this is an this is an indigenous company? It's, it has an indigenous perspective to the, the the material and the way that it was made. Is that something that has value, or do people the teachers just want something that says, "I got a problem in my class, I got to solve it." Right. So just give me the game that's going to solve it. I think that depends on a lot on the teacher. So my experience coming from two like sort of like diverging fields here, you know, uh, a lot of the games that we are getting into classrooms like that are not don't have a particularly indigenous like theme or focus to them. Um, they're more about you know just general classroom things that teachers need. But um, I I would say so. You know, I think a lot of teachers who are open to ideas of game based learning are open to different perspectives, you know, and showing them that you're coming in at things from a different way, but a different way that, you know, has some research backing and has some proof behind it and has like, you know, all those things that they want to know. Um, and I know that's a little bit different from if you're going into a, into a uh, indigenous community, like the, the, the way you sort of like go about this stuff will be very different from the way you would go about it into like just a general public school. But um you know, I, I think there is definitely benefit to that. And I think that you've got to find, especially another another important thing to do is find those teachers that will be advocates for you. Find those teachers that are really into it, that are really um, excited about using it and let them pilot your game. You know, maybe they can give you some feedback for what helps and then help let them, you know, help spread the word because having those allies who are just really, really excited about what you're doing um, can definitely help your case as well. Um, Hopefully that answers your question. And hopefully somebody else has something to say about it as well. I don't know. I can jump in if you, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I haven't really distributed games yet, so I can't really answer that question. But but maybe in the way that you think about distributing, I mean, you've been talking about projects that you're interested in, some that are not necessarily learning games, but they were more, if I understood correctly, you had some kind of ideas for projects that were kind of more entertainment games. Have you ever, what would, I don't know, have you ever thought about a specific, play, you know, target audiences or ways of selling games that have maybe a, an indigenous perspective in their development? Or is, have you not gotten that far? Oh, that was for me. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, in terms of trying to get it out, I think, I have been trying to think of ways to do it. Um, something I know for sure that I want to do is like, because it's, I'm making a game that's based off my community's values. I want to do a, like a game launch, for example, and have events where people can come in and play the games for free or try it out. And then that way, if they do like it, then they can continue it. Um, so I think having that kind of launch and then eventually, eventually figuring out how to get it to other places, um, like, you know, going towards like, in terms of distribution, like making sure that the people who I want to have access to it have access to it. Um, and yeah, hopefully that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, yeah, I'll let you answer the rest if you sure. have yeah. your ideas. So I've been pretty lucky that the majority of the language learning games that I've made have been commissioned by a particular school. So I do have a really strong relationship with their administrators and some of the teachers that are using them in the classrooms. And like they are very specific about the needs that they want filled by that game or the game that they're commissioning from us. 
Um, but in terms of like entertainment games, the way that I would approach getting it out there, um, like every time I make something, I'm my first thought is like, well, I'm going to put this in imaginative, right? Because yeah. it's like the festival for that kind of thing. And um, beyond that, I think I'm lucky enough to be part of like a community of indigenous game developers where we're all very supportive of each other. So like when any one of us, be it like an individual making their first game or like a small indie studio that's making a game, like everyone is very supportive and willing to like post about it on Instagram or like share opportunities as they come up for funding or like, oh, have you heard of this to potentially help you with your game or, oh, I heard you need a whatever, like an artist or a musician. Like there's a lot of reciprocity in the community where we want to build a sustainable industry and like help disseminate other people's work. So that's really helpful as well. And that's been my experience so far. And Avery, I'll just, I'll just, contribute a little thought here it's just like yeah i think the key takeaway for me just hearing these panelists talk is like relationships are like just super super important um i have no idea what it took to take to get cross-country canada and the yukon trail onto the computers in my classroom when i was in elementary school growing up but if you're able to get your social impact games onto you know, everyone's iPad in all like Canadian public schools, like, I don't know what you have to do to do that. You have, but you, I'm sure you'd have to like know the right people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it's tricky. Uh, networking, um, asking these types of questions, I think is a good, is a good start. So yeah. um, best of luck to you. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, you can find some success. Cool. Yeah. So I'm starting to feel a little bit like we're at the next tapped land. out <laughs> <laughs> we've been at this for almost an hour and a half but um it's been really fun I i'm just gonna turn it over to the panelists i think and any closing remarks on your side mm, make games you know <laughs> that's what that's my yeah. thing like i'm I'm not intimidated or upset to see like people coming up like other young indigenous people wanting to make video games because like I know it might be something like as a studio anyway being like oh my god. This other person is making a language learning game or an app that's my thing like no <laughs> the more the merrier like come on in. I am just one person with one studio you know we're a small team of three people. So like we can't do this by ourselves. So the more the merrier. I'm not gonna like be upset if somebody starts doing starts their own indie game studio doing the exact same thing as me. Like that's great. I don't see that as like competition necessarily. I see it more as like opportunity for collaboration because the more studios there are out there, maybe we could like band together and make very one big cool thing every once in a while. <laughs> so that's what I would love to see. Get out there, make your games, start a studio, and then hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> or before, if you need help, my email is out there on the internet. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, uh, going into making video games, I wasn't expecting to find myself here. But yeah, I think looking at like what you're doing, what Kenda Walks is doing, what Will is doing, and like what Maze is doing as well like it's all just been like for me it's been really inspirational and like knowing that like it is it's possible <laughs> it's not like a dream like it's not I'm not in a fever dream so for me that's kind of like the biggest takeaway is yeah finding that like community and just being able to have a chance to be able to just express myself creatively and having the opportunity and space to do that has just been really meaningful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would, I would, I would like to say the, the field of game design is very broad. You know, there's a lot of different types of games, whether you're talking about digital or analog, whether you're talking about role-playing games, indie games, you know, big AAA games, educational games. If you want to get into this, just do it. Find people around you who are also interested in doing it, whatever their skill sets might happen to be, and figure out what you can collaborate together on to make, because there's so many different things you can make and so many different ways you can make them. 
that it doesn't even it doesn't even matter where you start, you know, and you don't have to be nailed down to just one type of thing either. You know, you can make if you want to make a board game, make a board game. If you want to write a role playing game book, write it. If you want to make a video game, like find some people who can program or learn to program and do it. Um, and whatever experience you bring, whatever your background is, you're going to bring something new to this that nobody's brought to it before. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. You know, it's just so many different things go into games. Um, and that, I think that's why I love it so much is because there's just so many different skills and different ways I get to use my mind to kind of make decisions and create this awesome thing. You know, it's it's really cool. Perfect. Thank you all so much. This has been a really fun conversation for me. Um, Scott. Yeah, I'm just going to close off, but I mean, thank you. Thank you to everyone. I'm going to be in a spot where people can maybe see me on the Zoom. But thank you to everyone who sat through an hour and a half on the Zoom, because I know that staring at a screen for an hour and a half is much harder than talking in person an hour. But also thank you to everyone here in person and to you as well, Will. Um, it has been a fantastic conversation. I appreciate you all taking the time. Um, and there's this is just the start of many talks this week. So if you are still interested and you have bandwidth later this week, I urge you to tune in and see what else is in store. But again, thank you for being here. Thank you for talking and thank you for sharing. Have a great night, everyone.